Welcome and hello, my name is Zoe Partington and today I'm going to talk about, about barriers to, to really to applied art and to visual art for, for disabled people and some of you are probably working in this area already, some of you are already trying to um, make sure that you can make it as, as accessible as possible. But in, I'd just like to talk about, really, over the last 25 years, I've been working in this field, really trying to develop how organisations, museums, galleries, artists, curators, um, directors, front of house staff, how people begin to really think about improving access for disabled people. And a lot of that work has been around training and development. A lot of that work has been around looking at why why things don't change or why access isn't there and i think this is one of the fundamental reasons or one of the fundamental things you need to get right and you need to start thinking about it in in probably other ways and i believe very much because i um embrace disabled people embrace disability arts and also use the social model of disability quite a lot when i'm working with organisations and individuals and people and teams and one of the reasons for doing that is that I lost my sight probably 20 years ago um, and I noticed that or I realised that you were you were treated differently as a disabled person and access and inclusion and intellectual access and functional access um, didn't really sit together holistically as one thing. It was always split up. So there'd be people are very much talking about functional access. You know, people are interested in, say, if you're a blind or partially sighted person, producing large print for exhibitions, producing braille, producing audio, um, and that's relatively that's good. That creates a lot of access. That removes a lot of barriers for disabled people. So if the information surrounding your exhibition is clear, is accessible, then, then you can access the exhibition. But one of the things for me is that it needs to be deeper than that, because if it isn't deeper than that, nothing changes and people are always adapting things. It's a bit like the built environment. It's a bit like, you know, sort of, you know, rather than removing steps, people put sort of all sorts of adaptations into buildings to, to try and remove barriers and to try and make access for disabled people better. Um, but it still tends to be a little bit, just a little bit, um, what's the word, not a great experience. It's not as good as the experience of a person walking up the steps. You know, it's a different experience, but that different experience for me should be as valuable and as important as that person having a journey up the steps into a palatial building, into a beautiful environment. All that, all that intricate experience, all those things that you take on that journey into a museum and gallery as well even as a disabled person that should be it doesn't have to be the same but it should have that value it should have that feeling and that might be how that might be looking at things like how 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 are disabled people valued and um really um thought about within the collections so if you're looking at a collection of objects or you're creating new objects in the contemporary craft environment are those objects and things that you're creating really critically thinking about how a disabled person would want those things designed, would want those things to be part of the everyday? Or are you looking at them in a way that's quite abstract? So you're not actually talking to disabled people, you're talking to disabled to non-disabled people very often, I find, that actually really have one opinion, it's theirs, it's based sometimes on practical knowledge. But sometimes it's based on on just their thinking. It's not based on real practical spending time with a disabled person, learning and thinking about new approaches. And that, I think, is, is another area of, of importance to really value time with disabled people. And if you're ever developing or running a project, you know, start finding disabled people that can be involved, you know, maybe craft makers, um, you know, artists, People that have some, not just, you know, they're not just disabled people, they need to have some focus around what you're doing. So they need to have a creative background. They need to be interested in those conversations that you're having as a museum curator. 
they really need to be sort of working with you to get under the skin of the things that are missing or the things that we'd like to know more about as disabled audiences coming to your venue. So I think a lot of these things over the last 25 years, I've really started to, to see patterns emerge. And some of those patterns are not great. You know, some of those patterns are, I still see non-disabled people developing ideas and myths and resolutions and things, making things accessible without even spending a lot of time with a disabled person. And I also think it's really important to value what a disabled person says, because I do notice, um, particularly the work that I've done with blind departure sighted people, Sighted people still ignore what a blind person says. They still um, construct and develop things without that critical input from a blind person. And I think that's, you know, one of the things I'd say, well, I hope that you take away from today is to really embed that practical experience of working with disabled people, finding disabled people that are professionals that are working in this field all the time. There were lots of us about, I am not the only person but I think it's finding the right person and connecting. And one of the other things is to understand the social model of disability. And this, I believe, and lots of disabled people believe, it's, it's really important. And that's very much about whatever you're doing, it's to look at the barriers that are in that, um, in what you're doing. So that could be your marketing, that could be the exhibition panels, that could be the information that supports the exhibition, that could be the artifacts themselves. It could be the discussions that go on, it could be the workshops, it could be the talks, it could be the curator's talks, it could be the interpretation day, a symposium. But you need to really start looking and working with disabled people to find out where the barriers are within those, those things that you do you know, in a regular way. Um, because you'll be surprised, the things that you do that actually are sometimes quite discriminatory, but sometimes not including disabled people properly, and you push them away and disabled people won't want to get involved. So I think it's really important to start thinking about, about all of those elements. So the thing around the social model is so, so that you're really starting to concentrate on, on those barriers being external to the disabled person. So the disabled person isn't the problem. So the person with sight loss or the person that's blind or partially sighted, they're not the problem. You know, that is the medical model of disability where everything seems to be the fault or the loss of or the person not having. What we're really interested in is how can a person that's blind or partially sighted still have a fantastic experience and where are the barriers when they come to your exhibition? You know, are those barriers lack of large print, no braille, no audio? What, what exactly are they? Is it the way in? Is it the fact that the communication's not um, in the way that you need? So you're not using British Sign Language for deaf users or for deaf audiences. You're not thinking about other ways you might communicate to audiences that maybe can't, need some familiarity, need you to do outreach before the show, need to start engaging with you in other ways. So there's loads of different layers about how you can develop what you're doing. So the thing about, I mean, the thing about the social model, it's all the things in the external environment that make you a disabled person. Those things are disabling you. And I think it's really important to understand the difference. I mean, even simply, you could do the task. If I said to you, what is disability? And you would write down what that is in a sentence or a paragraph. And when I do do this with people, and the disabled trainers that I work with do do this, what you tend to see is a pattern of people putting, when you say, what is disability or what is blindness? And people put loss of, lack of, unable to work independently, isolated. So all these things are about the individual. They're not about the fact that, well, the person cannot function within the transport system in the UK because it's inaccessible. You know, the large print isn't, hasn't been available and those things are changing now because new technology is enabling that to happen. But it's all those things that in the past were real blocks for disabled people. And I think now we're really beginning to think, how do we embrace this and have these things in, um, well, I suppose I talked, I mean, in the, in the pre-information that you've got, it's talking about making it holistic. So it's building these things in from the beginning. It's not doing it a quarter of the way through or halfway through or at the end, which you see quite a lot. So people put a show together 
and they don't think about access till the end. What you need to be doing is thinking about it at the very beginning, building the budget. So if your budget is around marketing, that you're also building access to disabled audiences within that marketing sphere. It shouldn't always be a special add-on. It should be really central to what you're doing. And I think, for me, that is one of the most important things for you to take away. There are layers and layers about how to do things. I could give you all sorts of examples about how to how to improve what you do. Um, I can talk about projects I've been involved with. So I've worked um, around 2012, I worked very much with six museums and galleries across the West Midlands. That was particularly focusing on how blind and partially sighted people access museum and galleries, archives, collections, venues. And we did a lot of work around the, you know, all the different elements. So some of that was around not just the venue or the collection or the archives, or the exhibition or the show. The thing that was the blocking point for a lot of people was getting to the museum. So this is where we started looking at developing heritage buddies. Um, it was great at the time because it was MLA funded. I'm now working with RMIB on a new project which is called Sensing Culture. And that is also really looking at setting up heritage buddies so that those people, somebody who loves culture, passionate about it, can go to the gallery with you, can make sure that you get there, you feel safe, you don't feel isolated, um, and can spend the day chatting with you about the stuff that you can't necessarily um, access without that support. So that's just one element. You know, the other elements are marketing to disabled people, so what sorts of networks are you using, how are you getting that message out, how are you encouraging people to come, are you putting workshops on, are you putting things on at times disabled people can access? So there's lots of different layers of things. There's also thinking about things, particularly around using new technology. So, you know, using social media, using Twitter, accessing people that way, inviting people, having a regular slot where disabled people are welcome to come and get involved, find out more about the collections, having handling collections, and really having handling collections that have incredible value and you've spent time learning about how a disabled person may want to um, engage with that object, the types of stories that then can fold out from that. Um, all of that, all of that, you know, seeing, touching, feeling, smelling, emotional thing, you know, all of that connects you to, and stories, you know, particularly that connects you to things. And that's the same for disabled people as it is for everybody else. And I think it's really important to embed that in a lot of things that you do. I mean, one of the things, I'll just read this quote because I've brought my notes as well. Um, one of the things I, I saw was a, something from um, Nicholas Cerotti, who was obviously then director of Tate London, or Tate. Um, and he said, curating is less about orthodoxy and more of a place for invention. And I think from a disabled person's perspective, that is absolutely fantastic. It's a way to make change happen. It's one of the most important elements you need to know, and it's to have a framework in place that understands what those barriers are. And those, those things, if you start to look at the social model and you read the work of Vic Finkelstein, you look at Mike Oliver's work, you can see quite a lot of things around the social model that will give you really good insights, and it'll really help you begin to change things. But one of the other things is to think around the barriers um, that are, that are there for you as well, not just for the disabled person, but who stops you changing things so disabled people can access it. So I think it's really, really important to start, even if you have an action plan, you know, start to plot what are these barriers, how do they happen, who's involved in them, is it the conservation officers, is it the person making the products, is it the marketing team, is it you, is it the fact that you're not working with disabled people and asking them how to get these things changed. I'm probably making this sound really simple, but I can say after 25 years, there's all sorts of things that I know that make an absolutely huge difference. But you have to know about them. You have to know about the networks that exist. You need to talk to organisations like Shape in London, Shape Arts, Dash in Shropshire. There's lots of organisations around the UK that can help you embed and change your practice. I know today you're going to have some fantastic speakers. Bryony from the um, from here, from the National Centre of Craft Design and um, of craft is going to be talking about how they are looking at making exhibitions more inclusive to disabled audiences. That's fantastic. They've done some great work. And also Anne Cheek is going to talk about that as well. I think he's here talking about the research 
around using 3D printers to create replicas, and I'm sure she'll talk through more of that. But for blind and partially sighted people, things like that are so valuable, so important, give you access to collections that actually sometimes, even through audio description, can mean nothing. They have no value. Getting hold of something is very different. It really does give you, um, that's what the thing is, uh, just, just um, a sense of what it is. You know, if you can't see, you cannot work things out unless you can handle objects and have information. But that handling of the object is, is crucial to getting things um, for you to understand, really, to understand what something is about. So one of the other things is, I think after that, you'll be talking to Alex, who... Um, I've worked with at Oriel Gallery in um, in Newtown and um, part of a show called Flora and Fauna and that was very much about how can we use language and words um, and audio description to to really open up the collections, to open up exhibitions to blind or partially sighted people but also doing using words and looking at different ways of doing things can really open up your collections or your objects or your new shows to all sorts of disabled people and I think this is where it's really important to understand that if you if you use audio description as an example, there's lots of different methods you can use for different disabled audiences. But let's just take audio description as one thing, as I work a lot in this field and I'm, I myself am partially sighted, so I'm quite aware of where the gaps in provision are. Um, one of the things about using audio description, if you train staff and people get involved in it, you begin to realise it's not about blind people. You learn the skills of audio description. You learn how to embrace language and words to, to give meaning to a visual object. But what you do is translate this and communicate it to your audience. And what you become is a better communicator. So all your staff become better communicators. And I think that, for me, is really important because, again, it's, it's not about focusing on the disabled person. It's about how do we improve what we do and deliver um, so that things are inclusive and accessible and that you know that to me is 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 the way forward it really is and I know you're all working in this field and it is superb there's a lot happening people have all many many barriers economic and all sorts but I just think if you can embrace this and really have fun with it it'll develop and it'll move a long way and it'll really help um, open up open up whatever you do to to so many people I think that's the thing I'm passionate about this I absolutely love it so I could probably talk for hours um, it's probably not what Emma wants um, I will type a lot of the work up that I've talked about so you can have those resources I would say it's worth looking we can send other resources as well but it's worth looking at a list that I can give to Emma that people can go away and do a bit more of their own research but anyway, I hope you have a good day. I'm really sorry I can't be there, um, but I look forward to hearing um, any questions that you've got, whether we can get this working now on the on the Skype through Emma um, and, um, and Bryony at the centre. Um, so yeah, please fire your questions and I'll see if I can answer any of those questions. Okay, thank you.